Hi everyone, this week we've got two chapters to deal with, chapter 23 and 24. Sorry about the extra material, but it's really the only way to work it all in this semester. We've only got 16 weeks, and by the way, a little more than halfway there, so keep it up. Okay, so chapter 23 deals with World War I. World War I began in 1914 as a conflict between the major powers in Europe. Uh, we had on the Allies side, Britain, France, and Russia, and the central powers were Germany and Austria. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson sought to stay out of the war altogether. Eventually, the U.S. did get involved. This chapter looks at why and uh, the effects that the war had on Wilson's presidency, U.S. society, and on history in general. Wilson formed his foreign policy on this idea of moral concepts. He wanted to, the U.S. to be a moral compass for the rest of the world so that we could be a leader in doing things right and, and being just and that sort of thing. He soon tempered this kind of moral crusading, though, with actions that he thought were in the self-interest of America, which included deploying some American troops in several areas around the Caribbean just as protective measures um, to protect our ships that are out uh, during war times. Wilson's sense of moral righteousness soon led the United States deep into Mexican revolutionary politics and fighting, though. It nearly caused the U.S. to enter war with Mexico. As um, the war continued in Europe, a minority of Americans sympathized with central powers, especially the Irish Americans and the German Americans. However, just about everybody else, the majority of people, were sympathetic to the Allies. Wilson himself was an Anglophile, uh, or an Anglophile, I should say. You'll see that word in your slides. An Anglophile sounds horrible, right? But an Anglophile just means someone who um, appreciates the culture of Britain. So there you have it. Wilson was an Anglophile basically because as a student, he had studied English literature, English law, that sort of thing. So it was something he was familiar with. And he quickly, as president, instituted policies that favored Britain and the Allies over the Central Powers, even though his stance was to remain neutral. The, right, the rights of neutral ships soon became an important concern in the war because German submarines began sinking ships, and that included cargo ships with American passengers on them. America's relations with Germany grew increasingly strained, even though there were times throughout the war that Germany occasionally sought to accommodate the U.S. by changing its military practices at sea. Meanwhile, American public opinion turned strongly against Germany, especially after Germany came back and said that, hey, yeah, they are going to target all ships after all. So the U.S. declared war in early April 1917. A massive mobilization of troops and materials followed. This required substantial intervention by the government in the economy and major controls over food, industry, labor, and transportation. Civil liberties were a major, major casualty at home. Freedom of expression against the war uh, was strongly punished by the government and by vigilante groups. Attacks on war opponents and um, African Americans and German Americans were frequent. Women did manage to make some gains in the workplace, though, and they laid the groundwork for obtaining the vote through the 19th Amendment in 1920. Also, African Americans, um, during the war effort, with more people going to fight in the war, many African Americans from the South moved to the North and fulfilled positions in wartime industry jobs that were beneficial. And those wages the women and the African Americans got equal pay for their wartime work. Wilson offered his 14 points during the waning months of the war. He sought to make them the post-war settlement for Europe and for the whole world. He did achieve some of his objectives, but Germany was severely punished by the Allies, which really pretty much laid the seeds for World War II. One of the points that Wilson wanted in his 14 points was to have a League of Nations created. He felt like it was important to decrease the possibility of war in the future with this League of Nations that would be an international body designed to lessen the probability of future wars and to create communication and cooperation among countries. 
The treaty and the League were eventually defeated in the Senate, though. So the U.S. did not join the League of Nations, um, in part due to Wilson's stubbornness and his unwillingness to compromise. So that takes us into Chapter 24, the 20s. The U.S. became a more diverse nation in the 20s. This crusading spirit of the progressive era waned a little bit as people started thinking more about themselves, what they wanted, and what they wanted to achieve. So this is called a retreat to privatism, you know, turning the focus inward a little bit, not just individually, but as a country. You know, we've been fighting this war, it's over, and now we turn our focus inward to see what the U.S. needs to do in order to... Um, progress and move forward. The decade's early years saw the Harding presidency, and he is typically ranked seriously as one of the worst presidents ever to serve in the United States. Some people list him as number one in terms of worst presidents ever. It's basically because he did not accomplish a lot in office, and um, also because his administration was full of corruption. There's a little video in the um, slide presentation that you'll have to watch to see it. Anyway, you think we have corruption now. I mean, this was a big deal back then. His successor, Calvin Coolidge, restored dignity and honesty to the presidency, but he also didn't do very much. So, you know, at least he did restore honesty and dignity. From an economic perspective, the 20s was a time of rapid growth in terms of economic growth and low unemployment. The government was pro-business and anti-labor. Union membership fell substantially. Farmers suffered from falling prices and several ailing industries like coal mining and railroads. Uh, so everything was not perfect, but we did have economic growth and low unemployment. There were several issues that split Americans. One was prohibition. Prohibition had its roots in the 19th century, but finally reached its goal of ratification of the 18th Amendment to the Constitution in the 20s. The um, alcohol consumption didn't stop, though. It just went underground, supplied by bootleggers, moonshiners, and the growing industry of organized crime. And speaking of organized crime, if you ever want to learn a little more about the history of Hot Springs, look up the name Oney, O-W-N-E-Y, Madden, M-A-D-D-E-N, uh, has a rich history of bootlegging in New York and ties to Hot Springs, organized crime, and everything. So it's really interesting stuff. We don't have time to cover it in this chapter, but I wanted to throw it out for you. And if I can find a video, I'll include it in your notes as well. Um, the government implemented immigration restriction in the 20s, too, which, ser which seriously limited the number of potential new Americans that could come into the United States. Um, spawned by widespread racism and oppression, the Black Pride movement flourished in Harlem and elsewhere, and um, ideas from people like Marcus Garvey helped spread that Black Pride movement. Drawing from the women's movement and increasingly popular thinking of Sigmund Freud, the sexual revolution saw many women challenging traditional social mores that were, you know, the expected behavior of women. Many women started smoking and asserting the right to have sex on their terms, and um, also, you know, they'll get the right to vote in the 20s as well. There were some rebellious writers and artists who criticized mainstream values, especially those of small-town America. Racism surged at this time, and we saw a rebirth of the KKK, which eventually gained up to 3 million members. And the Klan terrorized blacks, Jews, Catholics, and anybody else who did not fit in with their idea of the perfect white conservative Protestant America. Um, check your slides as you go through because I include some information about Malvern's Klan chapter, which was chartered in um, 1922. Also, uh, the Republican Party remained in power. We have Herbert Hoover as president elected in 1928, who defeated Alfred Smith in the 1928 presidential election. Again, sorry there's so much material this week, but hopefully 
uh, you'll be able to zip through it. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Drop me an email anytime, as always. Thanks.